hi everyone, we'll get started in just a minute, just letting everyone join. Hi everyone, welcome to uh, April's Hyla Lunchtime CLE. Uh, today we are joined by uh, Daniel O'Neill, who is a partner at uh, Thompson Co. Cousins and Irons, gosh, that's a mouthful, uh, in their Houston office. And he practices uh, professional liability defense. Um, and Daniel used to be a tennis pro before law school. Um, and he is also, uh, weeks away from graduating from the Leadership Acad leadership Houston class uh, 11 or XLI, uh, which builds on what he learned as in the Hylers Leadership Academy. So just for anyone who is attending, who's also doing Hylers Leadership Academy or considering it, um, it's definitely, definitely something you can build on in the future. Um, so uh, Daniel is going to be talking to us um, about what's trending in professional liability claims and litigation. Um, questions are in, in questions are permitted, so please ask questions as we go along. Um, and I'll let Daniel take it away. Okay. Thank you so much, Harriet. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is an honor for me to be back. Uh, for some of you who have been around Hyla for a while, you all might recognize me. Before I aged out of Hyla, uh, I was a director for a couple of years. And I also spent a couple of years as either the chair or co-chair of the Hyla Sealy Committee with Ben Ritz. Uh, so I've just, uh, even though I've aged out of Hyla, it's been a delight to see how well Harriet and Rachel have been doing with the committee, bringing these excellent presentations uh, and definitely looking forward to the future of the additional CLEs they're gonna be bringing. Uh, so, so you all know, I guess, a little bit about me just before we jump in. Uh, I'm what's considered a gold star uh, defense background lawyer. I've only ever been on the defense side of these cases, never on the plaintiff side. Uh, but that doesn't mean that this presentation is not going to be fair and balanced. The goal of the presentation is this, this is not a practical CLE. Uh, so, you know, normally there are two kinds of CLEs. Practical, that tells you how to do one of these cases from start to finish. So those would be some of the past CLEs where you learned how to do a pro bono uh, family law or, you know, how to do a pro bono criminal defense case. This is one of the other kinds of CLEs that this is basically to give you some things to think about. Uh, and this is going to look at what's actually trending in both claims and litigation for professional liability. Uh, as you all might notice on the lead slide here, uh, I have the number three highlighted. So this is how uh, in opening statements, especially, or whenever I'm trying to present something, I like to put a number up front. And what that is, is saying there are three things in this presentation I'm hoping that you all are going to walk away from. So after the presentation, let me know how successful we were. If there are three things that you feel like you learned, um, you know, we can talk about what the learning objectives were and see how successful all that was. So thank you for joining me and let's go ahead and get things underway. Okay, so what is professional liability? That's usually the first question everybody has. So let's go ahead and start there. Professional liability is probably broader than everybody thinks it might be. Uh, if you had to just break it down to kind of an elevator pitch, it largely deals with licensed professionals. However, it can extend beyond that even. Uh, so what we're going to talk about for most of today is probably going to be legal malpractice. However, there's a lot of uh, accounting malpractice in the news, and especially we're going to talk about auditors in just a second, since when I logged into LinkedIn this morning, I saw something pretty interesting about that. Uh, we'll talk about trends for the rest of these, but uh, 
uh, realtors and brokers, insurance agents, brokers, directors and officers in both nonprofit and for-profit organizations, financial advisors. Uh, and then we get to some of the more specialized ones. Uh, depending on what your background is, I, I didn't recognize a lot of the names, so I'm not sure what kind of practice you all have that are watching. Uh, in medical malpractice, those are the classic chapter 74 kind of issues. Uh, architects, engineers, construction designers, those are the certificate of merit kind of situations. So the one thing that both of those have in common is uh, somebody who's been practicing long enough, if you talk to them, uh, the same thing with the chapter 74 expert reports, you'd hear the same thing about what happened with the certificate of merits in the architect, engineer, construction designer kind of phase, that uh, if a plaintiff wants to try hard and believe in themselves, they can find somebody who is gonna sign either the certificate of merit or the expert reports. So in terms of trends, those are still kind of where you would expect them to be. Those are not spiking as much as some of the other ones are. So as we just mentioned, uh, accounting and auditing, those claims are starting to spike right now. And that's for a couple of different reasons. Uh, on LinkedIn, this this came across the you know trending things you should take a look at. This is really interesting for for me to take a look at because um, I, I have a very similar case I'm working on right now, and I can't talk about that one, but I can't talk about this one. Uh, okay, so so generally, uh, I'm not sure if any of you all have accounting backgrounds. I think one or two of you might. Uh, so if, if you have an accounting background, uh, you know, just for general information, so you all know, uh, audits are designed to provide what's called reasonable, but not absolute assurance. So just like a lawyer is not expected to be 100% perfect on everything, auditors are not expected to kind of get in and ferret out every single possible little thing that could be an issue. So what's interesting here is before, as far as I know, any suits have been filed, uh, that at least wasn't in the news article that I was looking at, is that it's already been identified what the auditing issue was, is that it was the unrealized bond losses and the risk of a bank run. So the way that these news stories get presented are always kind of interesting. And this already looks like, you know, whoever actually wrote this is that it's kind of already been a fairly deep dive into the subject matter. Which and, and that's usually a lot more of a deeper dive than you'll see at this stage before anything has gotten filed and there are any pleadings. Uh, as I promised, this is going to be a fair and balanced presentation, even though I've only ever been on the defense side. Uh, so the next couple of slides, I'm just going to present a couple of things that, from my experience, uh, and especially a lot of the pro bono work that I do, it's important to have some of these kind of concepts in the back of your mind as we're going to start talking about what the trends actually are in claims and litigation. Uh, so hopefully you all have uh, learned about Terry Pratchett and, and maybe you've seen this before. This is a very popular thing on Twitter or Tumblr, and it's even made its way to TikTok these days as everything does. Uh, so largely this, even though it's from a sci-fi fantasy kind of background, it's really helpful as, as just this very impressive look at privilege. And when you're talking about professional liability claims, it's really important to keep in mind privilege. Um, okay, so, so the general theory uh, supporting this from Terry Pratchett's book is, uh, okay, so we, ha we have uh, Captain Vines, he makes, uh, okay, $38 a month. A good pair of boots costs $50. But then there's the other kind of boots that are actually affordable. So in the, in the, as the course of things goes, he ends up buying multiple pairs of the bad pairs of boots. And uh, this feeds into the sense of privilege that if he had just made a little more money, he would have been able to afford the better boots and he would have not had all the soggy feet. So that, that is a really kind of helpful overlook for this on what on the claimant side. And this also does have a real world parallel that I found. Uh, so th this is the tweet where it comes from it's called poverty charges interest, which is, it's the exact same concept, but it's just really helpful to understand 
And it's something that you have to keep in mind when you're working these cases um, and, and how these cases get worked up and eventually how that feeds long terms and in, in macro kind of terms into what the trends are these days. So that so that that's kind of some helpful background for us to just have some things to think about. And then we're going to go just a little deeper into what's in the news cycle, because whatever is in the news cycle ends up on the minds of the claimants, either before, you know, they're thinking they might have a claim, they're thinking, uh, you know, maybe they're going to have to sue somebody over this. There's a number of things that are running through their mind. Um, you know, this is probably the most depressing slide in the entire presentation. So I figured we would just get this all in one slide and then move on. However, there's a lot of important things here, and we're going to come back to some of these as we go through the rest of the presentation. Um, we're going to come back to what the pandemic trends are a lot, because that really factors in what's been going on for the last three and a half years almost. That really is helping figure out how we got from there to here. Uh, there is a lot of the historical inequity that is very important to consider because that impacts everything. It impacts from the times you're your small child, what kind of schools you go to, uh, the zip codes you're growing up in. All of that factors into the shared experience, the outlook, the background of who the potential claimant is and what their next steps are going to be. Uh, there's all the bad stuff in the news about the decreasing life expectancy, and that has a lot of, uh, you know, difficult root causes. It's not just one thing. Uh, a lot of the news stories that you hear these days are about uh, not just mistrust, but open distrust of these larger institutions. Uh, is, we're talking about the SVB bank collapse on the other slide. That's even one more kind of feather in the cap of distrust of institutions these days. Uh, nuclear verdicts are on the rise. That is that kind of us versus them, you know, make it hurt mentality that uh, people are starting to talk about. There's starting to be news coverage about. Uh, what's also happened is a big trend. Litigation funders are putting more and more money on the plaintiff side to fund these cases that, you know, under normal circumstances, they would have a hard time finding a home with the plaintiff's attorney. However, if somebody's willing to bet on them and they start getting a good rate of return on some of the cases, they're much more willing to put more money in the market and gamble. And last but not least, those favorite billboards on the highway, that's something we'll revisit in a moment. So long story short, what, what we're, we're kind of trying to get across with the slide is all of these kind of things are gonna add up to the feeling that there's this complex set of systems that is almost actively working against people and that the system is broken. So in general, uh, professional liability cases are complicated and they're expert driven. So for an average kind of professional liability claim, that just kind of feeds into the feeling that there's this complex set of systems that is just working against the average person. And, and the reason, you know, that's kind of helpful to just kind of have in the back of your mind uh, in some of these cases, because, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of the concept of, um, uh, if you've ever handled a pro bono case, uh, maybe that's the easiest way to say it. Uh, if you've ever handled a pro bono case where it involves your client having to go to court and they don't have any prior experience of what that's like. So for example, in a guardianship case, if you take one of those through the use of volunteer lawyers, there is one hearing you need to take your client down to. If it's their first experience with the legal system, they may legitimately say, uh, you know, have some kind of concern about whether they're going to end up in jail or something like that, because that's their perspective of what the legal system is and what the legal system can do to them. And, you know, so it's your job as the pro bono lawyer to actually explain what the system is and help explain how this complex system that appears to them really is, you know, it, it, here's what to expect, here is what, what, what we're going to have you testify on. There's almost no likelihood you're going to be going to jail because of this. And, and, and that's a large part of some of the other earlier slides that we've been talking about, how they feed into this of, uh, you know, people's background really does matter, especially in professional liability claims. And it's something you have to be sensitive to. 
And that is something that does have a lot of overlap with pro bono cases of making sure that you acknowledge it and appreciate it and, and you respectfully figure out how to give them the information that they need. Okay, shifting gears into claims. Okay. Uh, this is relatively oversimplified. However, this is a helpful starting point for really kind of how claims get evaluated. Uh, okay, so on one of the axes, we have, um, you know, basically a claim that is not worth anything, maybe to put that politely. On the other end of the spectrum, you have what are uh, I mean, depending on which side you're on, very good facts, very bad facts. On top of that, there's some kind of evidence that exists, whatever it is, that actually proves whatever the person is saying. So on the other axis, what you have is the spectrum from this is not really worth anything to this is going to be very, very expensive. And that's where policy limits and other things we're going to talk about are going to come into it. So a lot of people will think that this is a straight line like that, that just goes up between the X and the Y. That's not how most claims work. There are a lot of other factors that feed into this. There are a lot of other things that are going to matter. And uh, if you've ever handled a claim like this, uh, especially lately in the age of the nuclear verdicts and everything that's been happening through the course of the pandemic, uh, I mean, one of the most important factors you might see is potentially who the claimant's lawyer is, that there is a large gulf between somebody who has never handled one of these kind of cases before, and then somebody who is a, you know, somebody who gets $100 million verdicts. So there is a pretty big gulf between there. Uh, and then there are always some other factors. So you didn't think you were coming to Psychology 101 today, did you? Personality theory is something that really does feed into claims. Uh, this is also, it's gonna be a little bit oversimplified. Splitting things into a binary is almost never helpful, but you know, occasionally it is helpful. Uh, as long as we acknowledge it does oversimplify some things. So here uh, you have the classic type A, somebody who is, hostile, aggressive, uh, everything needs to be done right now. So, you know, there's nothing that can be done tomorrow. It's got to be done yesterday. Somebody who is ultra competitive. That's your classic type A. So some claimants want to represent themselves. Others are going to immediately have the lawyer from the beginning. And, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of tension between that. If the claimant is more of a type B and the lawyer is more of a type A, someone is going to win on that, you know, uh, on which one of those is going to be dominant. Uh, on the other hand, you know, you've got the type B, somebody who is a little more forgiving, a little more easygoing, patient, relaxed. So why this is important is that claims can really boil down, unfortunately, into two different buckets. On one hand, you have somebody who is a reasonable person overall somebody who has a reasonable appreciation of what the actual facts are rather than just speculating or you know, trying to view them in the light that's most favorable to them. Uh, somebody who has a reasonable estimation of what the case is actually worth. So on that side, those, real, those move relatively quickly. And this, the claim is worth something and that can be figured out and there's a lot of power in those kind of claims getting worked out when they're still pre-suit. So, you know, on, on that end of the spectrum, those are usually not going to result in litigation. Then on the other hand, you have uh, the type A person or the type A lawyer, or you maybe have the type A person plus the type A lawyer. On that end of the spectrum, they're not going to be reasonable about what the facts are, uh, you know, what the law is, if that's going to be a potential issue. They're not going to be reasonable what the case is actually worth. So on those, you know, it's not likely that's going to be settled pursuit. That's going to be one of those that is just litigated and every deposition in the world is going to get taken. Okay. 
And so now that we've talked about the claimants for a while, uh, we're going to have a quick detour and just talk about the licensed professionals on the other side of this. Uh, when we're talking about legal malpractice, especially practicing law is just very stressful. I don't think there's anybody on this call that would disagree with that. No matter what kind of practice area we're in, I mean, there, there is a lot of stress, whether you're in a small firm, you're solo, you're in a big firm, it's different kinds of stresses. Uh, same for you know, whether you're taking 20, 30 depositions a month, whether you're going to hearings all the time, or you know, sometimes you're not that busy and that's a whole different set of concerns. So I, I think we can all agree practicing law is pretty stressful for a number of different reasons. Uh, the accountants, the doctors, everybody else on the other parts of professional liability cases can also agree whatever they're doing is also pretty stressful. We've all been through a lot of, uh, you know, graduate school, some kind of training program. So we all can relate to the investments in our career and all the stresses that came from that before you even get licensed to start doing the, the thing that you're going to do. Uh, so, you know, this is just to say practicing law is stressful. There are numerous resources for somebody who would be going through a legal malpractice case, such as TLAP. There are a variety of other things out there as resources. Um, when somebody is hit with a professional liability suit, uh, and not just legal malpractice suits, th this really applies to anybody, that their livelihood and their reputation are threatened. And that hurts somebody, especially a professional in the community who, uh, I mean, their reputation is their word, is their bond for most professionals out there. Um, especially if it's their first suit, usually there's a lot of soul searching about what could have been done differently, what you know kind of set of circumstances led them to accept the case or the patient or that client uh, you know, in the first place. So uh, the reason why I like this quote from Mark Cuban is that uh, if you are a licensed professional, somebody is probably coming after you. Uh, that's just how the litigation scene and the claim scene works these days. For a lot of the uh, professionals that, that we see, the conversation is usually, uh, you know, it's impressive if they made it into 20, 30, 40 years of their career, and this is the first time they're getting sued, just because these lawsuits happen so often, and they're getting even more often as a result of a lot of the pandemic-related trends. So as we mentioned, we'd be coming back to billboards. Uh, this is a thing that exists. They are all over the place. This one is specific. This is the uh, We Sue Lawyers. There's plenty of others. If you drive up and down the highways, there are all the, the car crash, you know, if, uh, let's go sue them if you get hit. There's the We Sue Doctors, We Sue Nurses, We Sue Home Health Care. Depending on which highway you're driving on, you probably see at least five or six of these every day. So these are out there, and this is just a thing to be aware of that uh, it's not just these, you know, there are radio ads, there are, there are certain uh, plaintiff side uh, malpractice firms that will even put the name of the lawyer and or the name of the law firm that they have sued for legal malpractice. So that, that's also a thing that is just out there. And this presentation is not an advertisement for any kind of legal malpractice insurance or anything like that. Uh, there, are, there are no preferences. You know, I, I don't get any kind of kickback if you have insurance or if you don't. This is just something that I saw on the back of one of those Texas Bar Journals that makes an important point, I think, and is something that's helpful to think about. Because some of you on this call do have malpractice insurance and some of you don't. And those of you who don't, that might be a conscious decision, or you know, maybe you just haven't really thought about it yet. So what the ad says, it puts it side by side, uh, defense costs $67,000 in a legal malpractice case. This specific one that they're talking about related to a uh, lawyer, quote unquote, losing a child custody case. And the claimant is claiming that the case was lost because uh, alleged inadequate discovery and representation at trial. 
So somebody who was covered by a malpractice insurance policy such as this, they had to pay the deductible or the SIR, self-insured retention. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, there's plenty of industry, uh, you know, legal speak in this. Uh, <clears throat> so why this is interesting both is that I'm curious what the hourly rate was, and that's something I don't know on that, but that was probably, I, I to take something through trial, $67,000 is very low. So that that's somewhat impressive. That was taken all the way through trial. But that, that's something just to consider if you don't have malpractice insurance, uh, as, as y'all have probably heard before from a lot of people, litigation is ex expensive. So that, that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, not to bore everybody, and we probably won't spend too much time on this because uh, th this is not really my department. Some of this starts getting into complicated coverage stuff. So uh, to the extent that there ever is coverage related stuff, you would need to talk to my friend and colleague, Ben Ritz. Uh, and he would be more than happy to do a CLE on this and tell you all about that. Uh, but just for, uh, you know, these are hypothetical numbers. Sometimes it's helpful. Just, uh, you know, so if you have a malpractice insurance policy, highly recommended you take a look at it, understand everything that's in it. And if you don't understand what's in it, ask for questions. When renewals come, talk to your agent, your broker, whoever you get it from. They should be able to explain everything to you if you can't, you know, do your own research and figure it out. They're an essential partner in this, making sure that you are correctly covered. There are a number of different options you have. So that's uh, some of the bullet points we have here, just trying to set out you know, some different options. Uh, what, what works for one firm doesn't necessarily work for the others. Uh, so we have uh, premium, that, that's kind of the easiest thing to understand. That's just what it costs to buy into this. That is purely hypothetical number. Again, this is not an advertisement for any kind of specific carrier, any kind of line, anything like that. Uh, deductible, everyone is usually pretty familiar with that just based on how health insurance works. Uh, what gets more complicated though, and that's gonna affect your premium and, and to even which, which kind of, you know, how, how many lawyers you have in your firm, some of these other kind of issues. But whether your policy, uh, it's going to, whether the deductible is going to claim, uh, cover all claims in a policy year, or whether it's going to be what's called a per claim deductible. So the reason why that, that's a big difference, if you get hit with a couple of different claims in one year, those deductibles are going to add up unless you have the aggregate. So that that's one thing to kind of, you know, some practice areas, which we'll talk about coming up soon, uh, see a lot more claims than others. So that's something that feeds into it. Um, so deductibles can be contrasted with self-insured retention SIR. Uh, high SIRs can help reduce the premium that you pay. They work a lot, it's similar, but it's a lot different because it exposes you to a lot more risk, especially upfront. But there are pros to it also that you control a lot more of what happens upfront with the defense. Um, so there are pros and cons to all of this. Uh, there's no way to say, you know, deductibles are way better than SIRs for everybody. There, there is a lot of math that goes into this on why for some businesses, high SIR is very smart. And then there's math showing why high SIRs are a really bad idea for a lot of firms. Uh, with limits, that becomes more and more important with what we're going to talk about with social inflation and on top of that nuclear verdicts that limits of you know, pre-pandemic are probably no longer appropriate. Uh, so here we have a hypothetical limit of $100,000, but there are, uh, what, there are a number of names for this. The most common name, uh, in, in, I, I just like the concept of it, so that, that's why I use this, why it's the most common. Uh, we call them eroding. So even though your limit is 100,000, say for a hypothetical number, uh, if you have an eroding policy, all the money that gets paid to defense counsel to work up the case, do discovery and all that reduces what the limit is. 
So in some kinds of cases, that's actually very, very successful to get a very fast settlement because either the claimant or the plaintiff's counsel understands it's an eroding policy. If they send tons of unnecessary discovery, it's going to cost money that's going to come off the top and that limit is no longer going to be available. Um, uh, so that's uh, on, on top of just the general limit, uh, and depending on what kind of practice this is, uh, there, there's, always, there, there's always the option at least to have excess. And then th that gets into some additional issues, which are just going to be beyond the scope of this presentation, but it's something interesting to think about. Uh, retroactive date, how most of the policies work, and then there always are caveats. It would say you know, if you go out and buy insurance, Today, uh, the retroactive date is going to be today. Uh, you know, you're not going to be covered for anything that happens before that. However, there are some caveats that we talk about on the rest of the slide. Uh, it depends whether it's an occurrence or claims made. Uh, it depends if you purchase the extended reporting period, also known as tail coverage. So th there are a number of different factors that 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 can uh, increase or decrease really what the retroactive date is and what it means. Um, so if you all are interested in more coverage, stuff like that, I highly recommend uh, looking up a CLE or getting Ben Ritz uh, booked for one of the next CLEs because I'm sure he would really enjoy presenting on that. Okay. Uh, so in general, if you look at litigation on a long enough timeline, because history is always important, uh, these things kind of wax and wane. So this was a long time ago, although not that long ago, all things considered. Uh, a large company started getting hit with a lot of claims. So uh, once you're hit with the claim, you got to do a certain amount of work to work them up. That's discovery, depositions, all that stuff. Uh, so here, what the problem was is actually paying the defense fees to do all of that stuff, to work up the case, to be able to act, act adequately and accurately mount the right kind of defense for all these cases. So the problem that came up was basically somebody looking at the bottom line, how much money is getting spent on all that, and uh, one of the decision makers just said, I'm tired of paying for all these depositions. I'm tired of paying all of these discovery fights. Let's just settle all the claims as soon as they come in, nice and cheap. Uh, so unintended con consequences of everything exist. This is one of those areas where the unintended consequences were claimants understood pretty easily that even if they have an entirely frivolous claim that has no, no basis in fact or law, no merit at all, they're still going to get paid something to make it go away. So that's helpful to understand kind of the background of this, because as things change and, and some of the trends, especially right now, what is trending is efficiency, but in a much smarter way. So in professional liability policies, uh, what we're starting to see more and more which is really interesting, is that if the insured participates in mediation early on in a dispute, and I, I put the quotes on that because it's defined differently under every set of circumstances, the deductible is reduced. And anecdotally, in some cases, the deductible has been eliminated entirely, but that's anecdotal. Uh, that's a good thing for everybody. Um, I'll, I'll, claims that can be settled should be figured out quickly and early on. That's best for everybody. It's best for the professional for this ought to be pre-suit. Uh, it's best for the claimant if there is some kind of urgent need for money for some kind of reason, it helps them actually access that. And two, uh, it gives the, if they have a lawyer at that point, a significantly less amount than what they would get if it's in litigation. So that way the claimant actually gets more of whatever the ultimate settlement is. That works for everybody. It doesn't clog up the court system. It's all around good. That's why we love seeing this written into policies these days because it gets us in front of a mediator fast. However, I mean, the counterpoint is we need the other side to actually be reasonable, have a reasonable assessment of what their case is, how much it potentially might be worth, and how much they're willing to negotiate on that. 
even though we love seeing that in policies, if we show up and the other side wants $500 million for uh, what they're alleging is a breach of contract with their lawyer, uh, that's both above policy limits and not going to happen. So, you know, uh, while this is a great thing, it really does help efficiency. It just doesn't take care of every single case. And, uh, you know, there are other specific factors and facts that, that make one case different from the other. So now to talk about some of the big picture things, what's happening. Uh, as I mentioned, we were going to come back to what's going on in the pandemic. Uh, so that is a big factor. Uh, it, this has been a huge impact on everybody's life since uh, approximately February 2020. Uh, so some of the pandemic era stressors are uh, there are things that have been in the news that we see a lot that our neighbors, family members, everybody like that is going through. So in legal malpractice cases, the two biggest spikes we've seen since the pandemic are in so it's family lawyers that are getting hit with these, and it's plaintiff side personal injury that are getting hit with these. So on the family law side, this makes sense. Uh, for people who honored the, the original lockdowns and they stayed at home and they were privileged enough to have some kind of a job that they could go remote and work on the Zoom, they spent a lot of time at home with their spouses. And if there were already issues with their spouse that they were able to avoid by just not being home at the same time for any number of years leading up to that, that's when divorces started spiking because everybody was forced to be at home with each other in tight, uh, tight circumstances and also under less than ideal circumstances with the whole COVID thing going on. On top of that, uh, the type of cultural wars that have developed over the whole COVID thing uh, when their children involved of getting the kids vaccinated or not with the, the Pfizer or the Moderna, uh, wearing masks versus not wearing masks, all of the other kind of uh, cultural wars that have sprung up over this have led to some really bitter, really nasty child custody type fights. Um, yeah, same thing on uh, support issues. So all of those kind of conflicts have created a really toxic kind of space in the family law area for very, very angry, very, uh, you know, very type A people who are, are going out hiring family lawyers either for divorce, child custody, child modification, uh, child support modification, that kind of stuff. And they don't get 100% of what they want. That's when the problem occurs and, and that's when they start filing legal malpractice claims and i mean a lot of them can be what are considered frivolous but however once the claim is made is made and then that's how uh on the defense side what we need to do is take a look at it see if there's any merit um but the just the numbers on this are somewhat surprising how much the family law community is getting hit with every single kind of malpractice. So th those have been on the rise because of what happened with the pandemic causing so much discord in the you know family uh, child parenting relationships. By same but similar token, on the plaintiff side personal injury uh, claims, why they're getting hit so much, there are more personal injury lawsuits that are getting filed these days than there were pre-pandemic. So part of that is because uh, you know, when we kind of zoom out in a macro context, when times are good, uh, times are good. When times are bad, especially like they've been in the pandemic for the majority of people, you all might have seen those news stories about how the lines for the food banks were wrapped around the block and for miles and miles. So in general, a lot of the country was having difficulties of one kind or another dealing with the pandemic. So uh, as a result of that, and some of the other things we talked about in some of the earlier slides about just kind of this uh, distrust of institutions and uh, kind of you know, the anger that goes along with that. And, and there's a lot of historical background that backs that up on a number of different uh, aspects is that, uh, so they, they, they will file a personal injury lawsuit, whether it's good or bad. Uh, they'll find a lawyer who will take it. Uh, there's no shortage of billboards on the highway. 
and then they don't get the millions and millions and millions that they wanted. So what do they do? They turn around and then sue the plaintiff's side personal injury lawyer. Because there were so many new personal injury claims or lawsuits that got filed as a result of the pandemic, that's why th this is just the volume of these that could be complained against has grown significantly. It's not saying by any means that the quality of plaintiff side personal injury lawyers has changed in any way. There are so many fantastic plaintiff side personal injury lawyers. Uh, a lot of them we, we know through the HILA network even that they presented CLEs and, and we've seen them through other kinds of events. Uh, so that, that's something to take into consideration that um, uh, especially on this plaintiff side personal injury claims and on family law, if your client doesn't get 100%, or in some cases, even some of the claims, the way they come in, uh, if they didn't get 150 or 170% of what they wanted, even though there's law that says they should not get that, they're going to be upset. And when they're upset, they start filing legal malpractice claims against the lawyer who did not get them 500% more than they should have received. Another big pandemic trend, uh, everybody got on Zillow and everybody started trying to buy homes, uh, people who had been in smaller apartments or, or places that were just not working for them were buying homes if they were able to, they were privileged enough to be able to get approved for a mortgage, especially during that sweet, sweet time when mortgage rates were like 2.2%, unlike the 7% they are right now. Uh, so uh, a lot of weird things happened when everybody was rushing out to buy houses in the pandemic uh, because of the COVID related issues and also because of all the competition for these houses. A lot of people were doing such things as waiving the inspection, uh, waiving all this other stuff. And uh, they might be a little unhappy or surprised when they actually see the house they bought is not exactly what they thought it was. So that has resulted in uh, kind of similar to the plaintiff side personal injury issue that we talked about. There was just so much more volume of these transactions as a result of the pandemic that it's not necessarily that the quality of any of the residential real estate agents or brokers changed at any point in the pandemic. They're still the same high quality they were before the pandemic. It's a volume issue is that so many more of these transactions had gone through and you know, couple that with somebody who's just generally unhappy or maybe specifically unhappy about this minor thing in the house, they will file a professional liability claim usually against not just the agent, but also the broker and try and get two bites of the apple. Uh, so that's, that's something that is out there. That's also deeply tied into some of those family law issues because uh, splitting up a house, the marital home, that's an issue in family law. Uh, if, if as a result of the divorce is somebody needs to sell the home, that can wrap up two of these altogether because then somebody goes out, hires the realtor, they're not super happy with how the sale goes. And then they have claims against both the family law lawyer and then against the residential real estate agent and broker. So sometimes those can be directly connected. Uh, and then the other kind of big one that is happening, which is a little surprising to a lot of people because there's two different kinds of immunity and protections from lawsuits that volunteers get in the state of Texas. However, uh, what we're seeing huge growth in right now are lawsuits against nonprofit directors and officers. So that's surprising for a couple of different reasons. However, uh, if you all are fortunate enough to be in the uh, Houston Young Lawyers Foundation uh, Fellows CLE series, uh, there was a great CLE that we had there, I think it was about a year ago. Uh, and, and the comment was of why these cases are growing so much, and that was even a year ago, so the cases have continued to grow since then, is that, so it's this, this uh, kind of tagline of, of people think about it. People love a story of a good person breaking bad. There's even uh, two TV shows to that effect from the Breaking Bad universe. So anybody who wants to volunteer their time and energy volunteering as a nonprofit director and officer, uh, you know, usually has a heart of gold. They're trying to make their community better. Uh, so that, that's somebody who's trying to help things. They're trying to make the world a better place. 
And then comes in all these kind of uh, salacious allegations against this person that they are, they're stealing, they're, they're doing this kind of, you know, harassment, all, all these other kind of claims. So those are on the growth, even though there are two different kinds of immunity that uh, nonprofit DNOs get, uh, there, there's some interesting pleading going on these days. So I, I have a number of these cases around the state. It's going to be interesting to see if the appellate court feels differently than some of the trial courts we've been in. Uh, I see we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to speed this up and kind of go quickly through some of these. Uh, the main thing, so I, I get asked a lot, what's the difference between legal malpractice suit or grievance? The main issue, um, yeah, a lawyer can allegedly violate ethical rules, but are there any financial damages? That's usually what dictates whether you're going to get a grievance or a malpractice suit against you. And if anybody has any questions, because we're, we're about 10 minutes now from the end, uh, please just uh, put it in the chat. We'll, we'll get to it, I promise. Uh, so this was accredited for some ethics CLE, so I, I'll, I'll talk real quick about that. And also, this is the plug for the High Lift Game Night on Thursday. That's one hour of CLE. If you'd like to join us at True Anomaly, it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, and since I wrote uh, about two thirds of the questions, if you pay attention in the next two minutes, you'll probably get a lot of answers for Game Night. So, so thank you for watching this. Uh, so the, these are ways you can avoid getting a grievance, and, and this is just in grievance territory, but it also really does apply to legal malpractice in a different way. Uh, the, these are just a couple of rules I'm going to point out. This would really prevent most people from getting grieved on uh, if, if they kind of read these, understand these, appreciate these, and uh, you know they, they kind of understand people are out to get you. There are those billboards on the highway. Uh, rule 1.01. We should all be very careful not accepting employment in a legal matter, which we know or should know is beyond our competence. Uh, there's a reason why I do not do IP litigation. Uh, just like I, depending on what you all do, which practice areas you are, if I don't know you um, based on who's watching this, there are probably some areas you do not feel comfortable or qualified to take cases in. Uh, and, you know, th this is especially important for people who are solos and don't have the kind of support network you might in a small firm, a mid-sized firm, a big firm. Uh, you know, you, you might want that client, but think about it. Is it really worth getting grieved on or getting a legal malpractice case filed against you? Rule 1.02. One of the most important things you will do as a lawyer is um, engagement letter. If you take clients on without an engagement letter, that's an enormous risk. Don't do it. Uh, I don't want to tell you how to live your life, but uh, I think Rule 1.02 at least offers some guidance that you should probably have everything in writing and you should make sure your client's actually consenting, especially when you're trying to limit the scope. Uh, that's, again, especially important for younger lawyers, uh, especially if you are a solo or, or in a small firm where you have a lot more responsibility up front than you would in a larger firm. So something to keep in mind, you just want to protect yourself in circumstances like that. An engagement letter is one of the most important things that is going to come out of your briefcase when you get a claim or some kind of uh, suit filed against you. It's helpful. If you don't have it, that creates a whole separate issue. Rule 1.03, communication uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. That's one of the most important things. Uh, put it in writing, emails, uh, formal letters. Uh, if you have a phone call, put it in an email. So great to talk to you on the phone just now. Uh, glad we talked about so-and-so. You want to keep a client fully updated. On top of that, you can't hold back information that's bad just to serve your own interest or convenience. Uh, we all lose uh, hearings, we get motions denied, uh, we get motions granted against us, it happens, it's part of the practice of law, that's part of why practicing law is stressful. It's part of the fun of it too, uh, you win step two. However, you know, if, just say if you're on the plaintiff side and you just lose pretty badly on summary judgment, you have to go and tell your client the case is over. Uh, you, know, you, you can't just avoid that conversation indefinitely. Uh, and here for 
the rest of what we're going to talk about, uh, 1.15D, that is very important. Why is that important? Uh, you get something in the mail, and it's not a bill. That's always nice. It's a notice letter from your old client's new set of legal malpractice lawyers. So if you have some kind of mal uh, professional liability policy, call your carrier. I would also recommend Light Some Sage. Uh, so when, when you get one of these letters, and it, it, it'll even say it's uh, 1.15D, uh, they're going to request the entire client file. That includes emails and work product. It's the client's file. Emails belong to the client. That surprises a lot of people in these kind of cases, but yes, it does include the emails. That's actually pretty important, and you will get in some issues if you believe that it does not include emails. Okay. Uh, back to legal malpractice. Um, okay, so so these are it's professional negligence. That that's the kind of claim that they are when they're correctly made. On top of that, you're going to see gross negligence occasionally. It's not in every suit. It's definitely not merited in every suit. Uh, some plaintiff side lawyers want to put it in every suit, and that's why uh, past results do not guarantee future outcomes. But in every uh, professional liability case I've had where somebody has alleged gross negligence, I have a 100% win rate on summary judgments, getting rid of gross negligence. In every case I've tried, uh, I mean, we've gotten rid of gross negligence, so plaintiff side has never been able to put gross negligence in front of a jury. Past results do not guarantee future outcomes, but uh, I mean, around the state, it is a pretty high bar to keep a gross negligence cause of action in a professional liability case. If anybody does it, it's probably pretty impressive and the facts are pretty bad and it should have settled. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, while we still have uh, just a couple minutes left, looks like about five minutes. Again, just chime in if y'all have any questions, more than happy to address any of them. Uh, what is happening right now in uh, all kinds of professional liability cases, some of this is not even specific to legal malpractice. It's just kind of interesting how this works at uh, you know a large overview. Uh, in in uh, so they're called fractured claims. So uh, as we just talked about on the other slide, how you normally bring one of these cases, it is professional negligence. It's two years statute limitation. You don't get fees. You don't get attorney fees for bringing one of these on the plaintiff side. Plaintiff side lawyers don't like that. That's why there is this role. It's called anti-fracturing. Uh, very very successful on winning on summary judgment against all these other kinds of fractured claims because anti-fracturing rule, it's pretty well known, it's pretty out there. And it's pretty obvious what plaintiff side lawyers are doing when they start uh, trying to get attorney fees out of a case like this. So they, what anti-fracturing is, it says if it's a professional negligence case and everything they're alleging and all these other related causes of action spring out of what is a professional negligence case, basically the lawyer, the auditor, the, the accountant, the doctor didn't do their lawyering, accounting, doctoring correctly, they're limited to what the professional negligence cause of action is. So it's a two-year statute limitation. They don't get attorney fees, cut and dry. But in a breach of fiduciary duty case, they are arguing the exact same thing in professional negligence, but they're trying to get around the statute of limitations issue. I mean, so they, because they get four years on that, and also they get additional remedies of fee disgorgement, uh, they're not going to get out of professional negligence. Uh, DTPA, uh, if y'all had Dr. Steiner, this is probably ringing a bell on the tie in to the insurance code violations. Uh, the reason why they're trying to plead creatively and get a DTPA violation out of what is legal malpractice is they want the fees, they want the treble damages. Uh, realtors, brokers get hit with common law fraud, fraud in a real estate transaction, all those kind of things, breach of contract, negligent supervision, negligent misrepresentation. Uh, in, in the nonprofit director and officer land, uh, I've been seeing this more and more, uh, and it is uh, both shocking and a little funny. Uh, it's an invented cause of action. If you pull out your O'Connors, this does not exist in the state of Texas, but uh, it's it's this group of lawyers, they're bringing what's called a harassment cause of action. They don't ever cite to any law in their petition because it doesn't exist and it's not a real cause of action, but they're still bringing it against nonprofit directors and officers. I have a number of these cases. 
I, to date, have a 100% win record getting rid of the harassment cause of action on summary judgment. I hope that that maintains uh, because it's not a real cause of action. Uh, in, in the insurance space, uh, prompt payment is a thing where there is a suit against the uh, insurer itself. So uh, th those are going to be first party kind of cases. They have nothing to do with these third party cases where they're trying to bring a claim or lawsuit against the lawyer, uh, the doctor, the accountant. However, that doesn't stop creative pleading sometimes. Uh, so we're starting to see this more and more violations of the prompt payment statute. That can usually be gotten rid of uh, on 91A. Uh, if, if not, motion for summary judgment, there's some options to deal with that. Um, and, and so this is just a sampling, some of the more interesting pleadings that we've seen over the course. Uh, there's, there's no shortage of uh, creative and adaptive pleading. So there's gonna be new things that follow this. So if you see this presentation in a year or two, there's probably gonna be new bullet points we're gonna have on that. What else is trending these days? Uh, if, if you are responsible for your own uh, professional liability policy, I know that you've noticed premiums are getting more expensive in general. Uh, nuclear verdicts, those huge verdicts you've heard about, uh, they exist. Social inflation, uh, to boil that down, is basically saying uh, if the jury is unhappy, they're going to feel like they should reward the plaintiff more and more and more. So you know, pre-pandemic, they might have said, oh, that, that's worth $100,000. Social inflation now, same thing. Oh, it's worth five million. So what that is meaning, and, and I said at the beginning, we come back around to this. Uh, higher limits are are being required these days. Uh, it just is smart business sense, and to make sure you're appropriately covered. Because what happens is, if you don't have excess, your limit is say a hundred thousand. That puts you into danger territory. Um, you know, it, 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 that, so that, that's why people are reevaluating limits to go higher and higher, dealing with nuclear verdicts, social inflation. But the higher your limits go, you all probably know this from doing car insurance or any other kind of insurance you have, uh, not necessarily professional liability policies. That increases your premium when you get higher limits. So how people are starting to deal with this more and more frequently, which is a new thing that higher SIRs are starting to help offset the increased cost of the premiums. And that's starting to make more and more sense for people to get the premiums down and to shoulder more risk on yourself. However, don't do that lightly. Uh, if you don't understand SIRs, proceed with a huge amount of caution. Don't just jump into that. But that is what is trending right now for ways that people are trying to get premiums reduced. And in that way, I mean, that, that is one way to deal with it. Uh, in the, another question that I get often asked, and, and I, I guess this will kind of be the wrap up, what kind of person does well in a professional liability practice? Some of y'all might be watching the CLE because you might have an interest in changing your practice area. Uh, so who does well in a practice like this? Somebody who enjoys puzzles. These are complicated cases. There, there are a lot of documents. There are a lot of experts. Uh, if you like putting all that together into what is a good story, this is the right kind of practice area for you. You need to be a good storyteller. That's important just because these are complex cases. When you get in front of a jury, you got to figure out what the case is about, why it matters to people. And then, of course, be limited by all the stuff that you can't say, but you really wish you could say to the jury. So that's how, with all those rules and all those pressures, you got to be a good storyteller just because uh, as you take these depositions, as you go through the discovery responses, you need to figure out what the story is and why it matters and then be able to communicate that. So that's why it's a really rewarding uh, practice area just because you get to impact the lives of people who have been uh, more or less slandered by what are salacious allegations. And you get to get in there in the discovery process figure out what's the truth, what are just salacious allegations that have no basis in fact or law. Uh, you need to be a lifelong learner because we learn new things on every kind of case. Uh, in legal malpractice, you might be working on a federal bankruptcy situation where uh, malpractice is alleged there, then you move over to a family law case, then you move over to you know just generic civil litigation, but a kind of case you've never worked on before. So you need to appreciate and, and, and want to learn more about these different practice areas. Uh, same for medical malpractice cases are not 
uh, all, all alike. You know, it's different whether it's a surgeon, even what kind of specialty it is. So as you get in there, it's just really helpful to want to learn how all these things work. I often refer to this practice area as kind of, uh, I, each new case that comes in, it's like an episode of how it works. And if you liked watching that show, this is the practice area for you. Uh, additionally, uh, you have to want to be a trial lawyer rather than, uh, uh, so like a lot of people, I'm, uh, I, I used to work at a big firm. We used to refer to ourselves as litigators, uh, not as trial lawyers. And there is a difference if you're a trial lawyer. So you need to want to get in front of the jury because we try these cases. These cases have to get tried. Uh, if you wanna be a litigator, just occasionally take a deposition, that is a different practice area for you. Uh, additionally, it, it really helps to just have uh, some kind of background with pro bono volunteer service engagement in the community. You need to like talking to people. You need to want to talk to people. Uh, is how many slides I had on, on, I mean, hopefully helpful things if you haven't heard them before. If you have heard them before, just kind of understanding there are large issues that affect a large segment of society. A lot of them are complex issues. A lot of them do not have easy answers and one person cannot solve them. However, uh, if you take on a pro bono case, you are trying to make a difference. If you do volunteer service, whether it's at the food bank, uh, Houston Area Women's Center, you're trying to make a difference. And that kind of temperament mentality is really helpful for the professional liability practice. Every kind of professional that you have in, in this kind of area is somebody who is trying to make a difference and trying to help the clients or the patients or, or whatever it may be. So it's really helpful to just have that kind of the same, same temperament and mentality to mesh with them. And when you, if you do work on any nonprofit DNO cases, that already helps you. You know, you, you can talk about your volunteer background experience. Uh, last but not least, anybody with prior experience in a professional area is a great fit for this. Uh, in my first life, I, I had a tax LLM and I did tax controversy and litigation. So I worked with accountants day in, day out. I especially worked with them when they got accused of doing stuff by the IRS. So, uh, you know, I already had a really good background for working with accountants. That's why I, I really enjoy working on the accounting malpractice cases because I have familiarity with them. I have an idea of what's going on in these and it's all portable experience even though I don't do tax controversy and litigation anymore, it's all portable experience. So no matter whether you are a family law lawyer and you, you know, you're you thinking you might wanna do professional liability, that's all portable litigation experience. Same for criminal defense. Uh, that is all portable experience, getting in front of a judge and arguing. That is very important because you do that a lot in this kind of practice. So to sum things up, uh, if, if y'all are still on the line, uh, if you can't be good, be careful. I feel like that's good advice for professional liability in general. Uh, I have really appreciated y'all joining me. Uh, if you have any questions, I am gonna stay on, but if you do not have any questions, I will just say thank you all for joining. And I really appreciate everything that uh, Harriet and Rachel have done for the Hila Seeley Committee. So thank you so much. I, I'm so, so pleased that the committee is in such good hands with y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel, for a really fantastic presentation. Um, thank you everyone for your questions. Um, we, I think we're pretty much out of time at this point, um, but uh, if you have any questions for Daniel that you didn't have a chance to ask or you were not brave enough to ask, um, please shoot them over to Rachel and I and we will get them over to Daniel. Um, thank you so much, everyone. That was great.